And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. The one who is trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, the one who has surrendered his or her life to Jesus Christ has died. Welcome to the Sound Words Podcast, where it's our goal to help Christians love and live out God's word. If you're watching on YouTube, we would love it if you subscribe to our channel. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please follow, and this will help us reach more people with biblical content. This weekend is Easter weekend, where we will remember the death of our Savior on Friday, and we'll celebrate his resurrection on Sunday. And for today's episode, we're going to play a recorded sermon from Pastor Jesse Randolph from last Easter, titled, From Death to Life. We hope this sermon blesses you and compels you to worship our Savior who provided salvation for the whole world. Well, once again, a happy Easter and happy Resurrection Day to each and every one of you. Uh, today is a joyous morning. It's a blessed morning. It's a special morning as we, a community of believers, celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, uh, the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the fact of Christ's resurrection has been woven into each of those beautiful songs we were each privileged to sing and, and, and hear sung. It was reflected in the portion of scripture that I read for you this morning from Luke 24. And all of it points to the glorious reality that Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Messiah, uh, the eternal Son of God, the, the Prince of Peace, the spotless Lamb, the, the hope of the world, rose from the grave. And he rose from the grave after suffering unthinkably violent and agonizing methods of torture on a Roman cross. And then he died. And then he spent three days in a crudely carved out tomb. Well, that tomb is now empty. The tomb is still empty. We say Christ is risen. Praise the Lord. Well, earlier this week, I had lunch with a couple of different pastors, different occasions, and of course, when pastors get together for lunch the week before Easter, you guessed the question we asked each other, what are you preaching this Sunday? And the reality is there are a number of directions that a pastor can go uh, in preparing and delivering an Easter message. He can go the route of laying out all the evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, going more of the apologetics route, as he refutes all the theories that have been offered in opposition to the Bible's clear teachings of what really happened to Christ following his crucifixion. Uh, he can walk through the narrative of one of the gospel accounts, like Matthew 28 or, or Luke 24, which I read earlier, or John 20 or Mark 16. Uh, he can do a character study of various individuals involved in the resurrection, uh, looking at the event from their unique point of view or, or vantage point. You know, from the perspective of Je uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, or Mary Magdalene, or Jesus' brothers, or his disciples, or the angel at the tomb, or the Roman guards. Uh, he can do a study through 1 Corinthians 15 and look into what Paul says there about the centrality of the resurrection to the Christian faith, and the futility of our hope if the resurrection of Christ didn't actually happen, and the future hope that his physical re resurrection points to our having one day a bodily resurrection. The list of potential options for Easter messages is limitless. Well, we're going to go in a bit of a different direction here this morning. And if the Lord wills, we'll do one of those other studies on a future Easter Sunday. But this Easter, I'd like to start our time together by asking everyone a basic question. And I'm not looking for a verbal answer necessarily or a, or a hand in the air. Uh, it, as I ask this question. But the question is this, have you been baptized? Baptized, you say? Yes, baptized. Have you been baptized? Well, what does that have to do with the resurrection, you might ask? What does that have to do with Easter Sunday? Well, I would submit to you that that question and the answer to that question has everything to do with the resurrection and everything to do with Easter Sunday. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, if you have one with you this morning, to Romans chapter 6, verse 4. The verse will also be on the screen behind me in front of you. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, 
so that we too might walk in newness of life. Now here at Indian Hills, we preach line upon line and verse upon verse through entire books of the Bible. Uh, Right now on Sunday mornings, we're in the book of James. In the next couple of months, we'll be turning to the book of Colossians. And if you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church home, I'd invite you to join us for that. The point is, though, there aren't many times we're here at this church we'll do a a one-off message like this on a Sunday morning. And not many times where we'll zero in on on a singular verse like we're going to be doing here today. So before we parachute in to this single verse and connect it to the message of Easter, I think it'd be good to run through a quick survey of what the Apostle Paul has already been saying in the book of Romans up to this point in Romans 6.4. See, Romans 6.4 wasn't just dropped out of the sky. It wasn't meant to be read in isolation. Rather, it has a context, and we'd be wise to explore some of that context. The book of Romans is considered by many to be Paul's crowning work in light of the depths to which he goes in in laying out these key points of Christian theology and also key aspects of Christian life and Christian practice. In, In Romans 1, Paul has identified the gospel of grace as the central theme of this letter. In Romans 1, 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Keeping on in in Romans 1, Paul states that the wrath of God is dangling over the heads like a sword of Damocles or over those who reject their inherent knowledge of God as they suppress the truths they know about God in their state of unrighteousness, burying their heads in the sand and ignoring the existence of the God they know to be there as they stubbornly burden themselves more and more under the avalanche of the weight of sin. Sin which makes them feel free. Sin which makes them feel happy. Sin which makes them feel like they're just being their true self. But sin which ultimately never satisfies whatever carnal craving they're chasing. Also in Romans 1, Paul has highlighted this progressive downward slide into godlessness that he witnessed in his day, and which we see in our day as well. A slide which includes a a failure to acknowledge God or give thanks to God. A slide which results in, in foolish hearts becoming darkened in their futile speculations. Proclaiming to be wise, Paul says, they became fools. A slide which includes the worship of anything other than God, including nature and government and politics and philosophy and tradition and pleasure and and the God of our day, self. And finally, he, he highlights this slide which leads to a society being completely given over by God to their basest carnal desires, which is exactly where we are today in the God gave them over phase of history. In Romans 2 now, Paul describes how the Jewish people of his day, though they had been given the law, the old Mosaic law, were equally along with the Gentiles under the judgment of God because as Paul says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, not even one. We have all sinned, Jew and Gentile alike, and fall short of the glory of God, as he says in Romans 3.23. And to those who might quibble with his premise and try to work their way toward God through the keeping of the law, Paul makes very clear that their efforts will never succeed. He says in Romans 3.28, a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And that's the key, faith. An otherwise guilty sinner is justified meaning they are declared to be in a right standing before God. And ultimately, they are saved by that God, not through the law, not through their deeds, not through their performance of good works, not through being better than most of society, but rather through faith. And in Romans 4, Paul goes back to the Old Testament and explains how Abraham, the father of the nations, an Israelite, a Hebrew, was not justified by his works, was not justified by being an A-plus Old Testament saint, but rather he was justified on account of his faith. That's what he says in Romans 4, 3, quoting from the book of Genesis, where he says, for what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then we have Romans 5, 1, 
which explains that, it's, that justification brings salvation and it brings peace with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When a person is justified, which again happens by faith, they go from being an enemy of God to being a child of God. They go from being a child of darkness to being a son of light. They go from being a slave of sin to being a slave of Christ and a slave to righteousness. But hear me, there are no works involved in justification. There is no self-effort or, or, or human will involved in becoming a Christian. Rather, one is justified. A, a person is saved, and they are once and forever saved because they put their faith not in self, but instead they put their faith in the once and forever sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's it. That's the wonder and the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel. If I could put it into one sentence, a person is saved by believing in Jesus Christ. They, they believe that he's died, they believe that he was buried, and they believe as we celebrate this Easter morning that he was raised. With that, we come back to our text. Again, it's on the screens behind me. If Romans 5 is all about justification, how a person gets saved, Romans 6 is all about sanctification, which describes that progressive process by, by which one who has been justified, who has already been saved, grows in holiness and godliness and Christ-likeness as he or she, with the help and the conviction and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, is conformed into a greater and greater degree into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And if we were to do a study uh, in, this morning all through Romans 6, we'd see here that Paul is challenging believers, those who have already been justified, those who have already been saved, to live these upright and godly lives in Christ Jesus, to grow in sanctification. In fact, let's get a little context by looking at Romans 6. The first three verses here sort of back into our verse. Romans 6, 1, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? In these just, just these few verses, we see two words repeated, and they're set in contrast against each other, and they certainly stand out. Those words are death and life. Now, to the unbelieving world, those words, death and life, represent the, the polar extremes of their 75 or so year existence on this spinning ball of dirt that we call earth. They will live, and then they will die. For the Christian, though, those two words represent the very core of our identity, we die, and now we live. The message this morning is titled, From Death to Life. And there are three uh, main points, three main takeaways I want to draw out from this text here. And they, they track what Paul is saying here in Romans 6, 4. Point one is that Christians have been buried with Christ. Point two is that Christians have been raised with Christ. And point three is that Christians now live for Christ. We'll start with the first point that we as believers have been buried with Christ. Look at the first few words here of, of verse four. He says, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into his death. Paul here again is writing to believers, to Christians. And he is saying here that if we are followers of Jesus Christ, if we have repented of our sins and put our faith in Christ, we've been buried. Well, you only bury what kind of person? A dead person. One who is no longer living. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. The one who has trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, the one who has surrendered his or her life to Jesus Christ has died. They have been buried with him. They are dead and buried. The old man has died and now he's six feet under, never to be seen or heard from again. Now, now, what type of death is Paul referring to here? Does he have a physical death in mind? 
Uh, when he says we have been buried with him, is he talking about physical burial? No. Paul here does not have in mind tombstones and headstones and grave markings. Look what he says next. We have been buried with him through baptism into death. Do you remember the question I asked at the beginning? Have you been baptized? What Paul here says is why I asked that question. We, meaning Christians, have been buried with him through baptism into his death. Now, the him that's mentioned here is very clearly a reference to Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that from Romans 6, 3, right before this, where it says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? So in what sense are Christians baptized into Christ Jesus? In what sense are Christians baptized into his death? Well, when I use that word baptism, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I have an idea about what some of you might be thinking. You're, you're thinking about a, a clear substance, a substance that's necessary for human survival. It can appear in liquid or frozen or steam forms. Um, it, it, it shows up on the periodic table of elements, if you put, put them all together, as H2O. You're thinking about water. That's what we think about when we hear the word baptism in our day. Our mind naturally goes in the direction of an event involving water, whether it's submerging or immersing somebody in water or sprinkling them with water in certain traditions. But is that what Paul has in mind here? Is he teaching that we are buried with him, meaning with Christ, when we are baptized into water? Is he, in a sense, teaching here that we have to be baptized into water in order to have a right relationship with God? Is this how one becomes a Christian? Is this how one becomes a child of God? By getting wet? Absolutely not. This passage has nothing to do with water. H2O wasn't on Paul's mind when he wrote these words. The word for baptism here comes from a Greek word, baptizo. And you can hear the, old, the connection between the old Greek word, baptizo, and our English word, baptism. And a core definition of that Greek word, baptizo, during Paul's time was to place into. Like picture a, a white cloth being immersed, plunged, dunked into a vat of red dye so that what comes out is totally different. To be placed into is, is one of the main definitions of baptizo. Another definition of this term baptizo is to publicly identify with as in to, to publicly identify with the person or the thing that you're being baptized or placed into. Let me give you a few examples from Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2, Paul, referring to the Israelites, says, Our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and, and in the sea. That there is referring to the Israelites of Moses' day identifying with their leader, Moses. Or in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. That's referring to believers identifying, being placed into the church. Galatians 3, 27 says, All of you were baptized into Christ. We just saw in Romans 6, 3 that Paul speaks of being baptized into Christ Jesus. And here in verse 4, he says, you have been buried with him through baptism into death. Again, this is a statement of identification. To be baptized into Christ, to be baptized into his death means to be identified with Christ's death and burial. And ultimately, as we're going to see, identified with his resurrection. Now, I don't want us to miss the, the richness and the beauty of what's being described by Paul here when he says we've been buried with him through baptism into death. At the cross, Jesus died a real and physical death for our sins. Uh, the, the placement of his body in the tomb, the closing of the tomb, the, the sealing of the tomb, the guarding of the tomb, these are all biblically recorded and historically verifiable events which testify to the reality that the Lord actually died. He didn't merely go unconscious or, or fall asleep or, or swoon or faint. No, he actually died upon the cross. 
And track with me on this now. As Christians, we have not only been legally declared righteous and justified and saved on account of our faith in Christ, we've also been brought into an intimate and living union with Christ. We're identified with him. We're united with him. We're joined with him. We're fused with him. And what that means is that the moment we trusted in Christ, the moment we experienced that washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit that Titus 3 talks about, we died with him. As John MacArthur puts it, we attended our own funeral. As we died, so he died. As he died, so we died, I should say. And Colossians 3.3 3 says it, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We died with Christ so that we are dead to our old way of life. Galatians 2.20 says it absolutely clearly. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Or 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The old us, the adulterer, the drunkard, the liar, the chief, the, the thief, the cheat, the homosexual, the sexually immoral person, the one described in Titus 3.3 3, who was foolish and disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another, is now not only in the rear view, but is under the four wheels of the car. He's dead. When the Lord died for sin, we died to sin. Though we still do sin, Sin no longer has control over us like it once did. It no longer reigns over us. We no longer live under the tyranny of sin. We no longer live under the cruel mastery of sin. We no longer live under the harsh yoke of sin. Just as Christ, in accordance with the scriptures, was, was died and was buried, we as Christians who have been united with Christ, like our Lord, also died. We were buried with him through baptism into death. Now, so far, we've only covered burial and death and what it means to be baptized or identified with the Lord's death. If we ended the message there, we'd be still stuck on the events of Good Friday, the, the crucifixion of our Lord, the death of Christ, the rolling of the stone shut to seal the tomb. But we know the story doesn't end there, does it? No, that's why we're here this morning. We're celebrating, commemorating the fact that the Lord was raised, that he was resurrected, that he is risen. He was dead, but he came to life. We think of the words of the, the angel to Mary Magdalene in Matthew 28 verses 5 and 6, where he says, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. Or we think of the account in the gospel of Luke of those same events, what I read in our scripture reading this morning, Luke 24, 2 and 3. And when they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, they entered and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. The tomb was empty. There was no body there. There were linen wrappings and a face cloth there, according to the Gospel of John, but the, the crucified Lord of glory had risen from the dead. And bringing it back to our text, Romans 6, 4, when Jesus rose from the dead physically, we rose from the dead spiritually. And that brings us to our second idea this morning. The Christian has not only been buried with Christ, he has been raised with Christ. Look at the middle portion of the, of the verse here. It says, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Paul here is continuing on with his thought about believers having been buried with him through baptism into death. And as he does so, he transitions, you could say, from Good Friday to Easter Sunday, as he now centers on the reality of the resurrection. Now note here that Paul isn't leaving any room as to whether he believes the resurrection of Christ actually occurred. It's not if Christ was raised from the dead or assuming Christ was raised from the dead. No, what does he say? As Christ was raised from the dead. To the apostle Paul, this is settled fact. This is undeniable reality that Christ was raised 
from the dead. He was physically and bodily and provably raised from the dead. He submitted himself, the Lord did, to the will of the Father. He bore our sins upon the cross. He became sin for us. He he suffered the penalty for our sin in his body. He endured the wrath of God in our place and he paid the ultimate price for our sins through his death. And and following his crucifixion, he lay there in in the tomb, dead, with with burial cloths wrapped around his head and, and burial linens wrapped around his body. But then, just as he had physically died, he was physically raised. He physically rose. Jesus arose in a physical body and he lived in that body among his disciples for 40 days where they had the opportunity to to see him and hear him and touch him and feel the imprints where, where the nails had gone in and watch him eat fish. He was physically raised. There is no doubt, there is no debating that the Lord actually died and there is no doubt and there is no debating that he was truly and physically raised from the dead. I love how Charles Spurgeon links the death of Christ to the resurrection. Listen to these words. He says, his death wears no dishonor on its brow for his rising again has set a diadem thereon. We celebrate Gethsemane and Calvary and find no bitterness in all their grief because death is swallowed up in the victory of resurrection. The whole earthly life of Jesus with its poverty, its slander, its sorrow, its scourging, its spitting, its crucifixion is raised above all trace of dishonor by his glorious resurrection. Amen to that. And that event, the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ is central not only to world history and not only to our worship here on Easter Sunday, but to every aspect of our lives as Christians. For instance, the resurrection of Jesus Christ highlights for us the nature and the character of God as being a God who is abundant in patience and mercy and grace and goodness and love. The resurrection of Christ certifies for us the statements that the Lord made himself concerning his deity and his future resurrection, confirming the fact that he is who he claimed to be, the very son of God. The resurrection of Christ means that the penalty of sin and death, which we looked at on Good Friday, which had otherwise been hanging over each one of our heads, has now been dealt with. And not only that, the resurrection of Christ means that we ourselves will one day be physically raised as we receive new resurrection bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 says, we will one day be sown in a perishable body and raised in an imperishable body. But again, What Paul is highlighting for us in our text today, Romans 6, 4, is our unity, our union with Christ. He's highlighting the fact that just as we as believers are united with Christ in his death and in his burial, so too are we unified and in union with him in his resurrection. And just as he rose physically from the grave, just as he was physically resurrected, we too have undergone a spiritual resurrection resurrection. When God resurrected him, he also resurrected us. We haven't been rehabilitated. We haven't been resuscitated. We haven't been fixed up versions of the old person. No, we have been resurrected, entirely new people, entire, entirely new creations. And it's all been done, verse four says, through the glory of the Father, meaning through the power of the Father in this context, the omnipotence of the Father. It was God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead, breaking the shackles of sin and death and bringing him back to life. Colossians 2.12 confirms it, saying that we were raised up with him, meaning Christ, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Well, that now brings us to the final part of verse four here, where Paul says we've not only been buried with Christ, through baptism, and not only raised with Christ as he was raised through the glory of the Father, but he gives a purpose clause here at the end of verse four, where he says, so that, or so we too might walk in newness of life. 
Our first point was we've been buried with Christ. Our second point was we've been raised with Christ. The last point is we are now living for Christ. Having been buried with him through baptism into death and having been spiritually resurrected in keeping with our Lord's physical resurrection, we now walk in newness of life. It's not that our old life has been altered to be better than it once was. Again, we haven't been rehabilitated. We're not the ultimate fixer-upper. We haven't been polished or or spit-shined on the outside while the inside is still crumbling and decaying. Quite the contrary. We've been transformed. We've been given a totally new life. We've been spiritually resurrected unto true life. And this new life that we've been given, this resurrected life, empowers us to walk in newness of life. And that word walk refers to our daily manner of life, our, our, our daily spiritual conduct as we put one foot before the other, spiritually speaking. And that's speaking again of the Holy Spirit's continuing work of growth and sanctification in the lives of believers, which again is Paul's focus here in the entirety of Romans chapter six. In fact, if you have your Bibles, let's read a few more verses past verse four here where we see that this idea of of walking in newness is all throughout this chapter. Look at Romans 6, 5. He says, For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, verse 11, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. When a person comes to true saving faith in Jesus Christ, when they say that they believe in his death and resurrection, when they claim the promise of Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Such a person will not, in fact, they cannot live like they once did. No, when when we are baptized into Christ's death, And into his resurrection, we are raised to walk in newness of life. We are new creatures. We have, as Paul says in Ephesians 4.24, put on the new self. The, The resurrected Christ is not only the savior of our souls, he is the Lord of our lives. And the new life that we now live, if we claim to be a follower of Christ, will be seen daily, visibly in our walk. We're walking on a new walk. We're walking on a new path. We're led by a different master, no longer drug along by our sin, but rather a master whose whose yoke is easy and his burden is light, Jesus Christ. Guided by his spirit, hungry for his word, conversing with him in prayer, seeking fellowship with his people, the, the church, convicted by and grieving over the sin that still remains and resolving to follow him faithfully in each and every area of our lives. The words to Charles Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be, come to mind here. He says, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in nature's night. That's the old man. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. That's where most professed Christians end the hymn, by the way. But look what he says. I rose went forth and followed thee. That's walking in newness of life. Rising, going forth, and following him. Now I recognize that even in our day, a a lot of people still call themselves Christians, especially in our part of the country. The the scary thing though is that while a lot of people will will gladly don the label of, of Christian, by wearing the cross necklace or or getting the Bible verse tattoo or posting an an occasional spiritual thought on social media or using Christian speak like God bless or praise the Lord or even today, he is risen. They very clearly are not walking in newness of life. 
Instead, they are totally given over to sin. What if that describes you here this morning? What if you're living the same way you used to live before you made a profession of faith in Christ? What if, if you get really honest with yourself, you would say, I am not walking in newness of life? Well, if that describes you, you really have to do what 2 Corinthians 13 talks about, which is to do some self-examination. Because you cannot, with that sort of testimony, confidently state that you are a new creature. You cannot confidently state that you're a Christian. As Paul says in Romans 6, 2, we saw it earlier, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or, or even more pointedly, John in 1 John 3, 9 says, no one who is born of God practices sin. In other words, a person cannot, just as a person cannot be dead and alive at the same time, it's one or the other, a person cannot have been made alive in Christ and still have patterns and lifestyles and habits that very much still show that they are dead in their sin. They can't just sort of slap on a coat of Christian varnish on a spiritually decaying corpse and call it good. Does that mean believers never sin? Of course not. 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1.10 says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Of course, Christians do sin. But the question is really one of identity, meaning if the piercing searchlight of heaven were to scan your soul right now, unearthing and exposing every thought, every deed, every practice you find yourself engaged in on a consistent and regular basis, would that light reveal a person whose fundamental identity is their relationship with Jesus Christ? Is that what's most valuable to you? Or instead, would that light reveal a person whose fundamental identity is their sin? Whatever that sin is. No one can serve two masters. The Lord himself said that. So the question is, who is your master? What is your master? Though you, perhaps you've made a verbal profession of faith in Jesus Christ, are you truly walking in newness of life? I'll end this morning's message the way I started it by asking the same question I began with at the start of the sermon. Have you been baptized? I'm not asking whether you've been submerged into water. I'm not asking if you've been sprinkled with water. What I am asking is if you have been placed into Christ, if you've been identified with Christ, identified with his death, identified with his burial, identified with his resurrection. If you have, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You have reason of reasons to celebrate and rejoice this Easter morning. Your sins have been washed away and paid for. You have been forgiven on account of the great love that you've been shown by God through your risen Savior, Jesus Christ. You have reason to celebrate that not only this day, but every day. The resurrection is something you can revel in daily as you praise your Savior all the day long. But if you haven't been baptized meaning you haven't been placed into Christ. Don't leave this place this morning without seeking forgiveness for your sin from God through the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't leave without acknowledging that, that you are a sinner, just as I am a sinner. But unlike me and all the Christians in the room here this morning, your identity is not in Christ. Your identity is in your sin. And that's why you find yourself drowning. And that's why you find yourself always having that gnawing sense of dissatisfaction. And that's why you always find yourself feeling purposeless and rudderless and hopeless. And that's why you find yourself feeling like you cannot achieve victory over your sin, whatever that sin is. It's because you have yet to be washed and purified and cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So this Easter, I pray that you'll come to Christ, that you'll eliminate the excuses, that you'll overcome whatever fears you might have of what others might say or think, that you'll seek shelter from the wrath of God that's found only in the shadow of the cross of Christ, and that you'll be buried with him as the old passes away, 
and that you'll be raised with him as the new you comes to life.